So let's have a thought here. Instead of blindly filtering the signal, maybe we can shape the pulses to occupy less bandwidth. What if we found a way to make a smoother transition between each pulse? So here on the left, you can see a smoother transition. And um, the resulting filter might look like what we see over here. Um, and we could still maybe filter out this extra piece over here on the right um, that maybe wouldn't affect it too much in the time domain. So the idea is there's some way that we can filter our time domain signal to give us a little bit more of a very limited uh, frequency signal. So it turns out there is a solution and it's called a Nyquist pulse. So Nyquist noticed that um, these pulses, when we smooth them, basically when we try to filter them in the frequency domain. So if we go to frequency, if we try to build this low pass filter we talked about, the pulses end up going from a square pulse to this pulse where the sides uh, have some signal that will interfere with future pulses. And um, the insight he had was, well, maybe this isn't so bad if this is exactly zero, exactly zero when our next pulse is. And so what he did is he proposed a, small, a smart pulse shape. And what he basically said was, first of all, notice this plot is in the time domain. If you remember, the Fourier transform or inverse Fourier transform of a box in the spectral domain would give you a sink in the time domain as the impulse function, right? The impulse response of the filter. And the reason why he thought uh, this would be a good idea is if he could do uh, a filter that would create a pulse that at our time zero, we saw the pulse we wanted, and at the next sampling point, it was zero, then it would have no effect on our next pulse. And so no intersymbol interference would be introduced. And so this is an important one to, uh, to take a look at, is if I sample the dark black curve here, and I come along and the dark black curve is zero here, that means that I could sample here and get the gray curve and there would be no effect of the black curve just as I could sample here and get the dashed curve and there'd be no effect of either the gray or the black curve. So the key isn't that we're getting rid of these tails. We're just making sure that at the point we want to sample, at the point we care about, that all of the tails are zero. And so this is kind of a clever trick he figured out. And Nyquist uh, realized that not only does it remove um, the intersymbol interference, but it also results in the absolute minimum bandwidth uh, for the modulated signal, which would be uh, ideal because basically this is saying um, this is the smallest bandwidth you can get to transmit uh, the pulse information that you'd like to. So with a Nyquist pulse, the modulated RF signal occupies 1 over uh, TB, so the total bandwidth here is 1 over TB, right, for uh, frequency uh, that's there. And so this would be the m uh, minimum bandwidth that you could use. It turns out, though, it's actually not very easy to create a Nyquist pulse. And so people have looked at uh, close approximations, and one of the best one is a raised cosine filter or raised cosine um, pulse. And um, this is the time domain uh, formula for the pulse shape. And on the right is actually uh, the bandwidth. And the reason this is called a raised cosine is it's actually defined as zero. And then we do a cosine up to here. And then we keep this flat right there. And these are done digitally. So uh, there's uh, some digital signal processing that figures out how to shape this in the frequency domain. And um, the uh, bandwidth is uh, really, because this is sort of an artificially designed filter, is the distance between these two edges, because it really is zero out here and zero out here theoretically. So the bandwidth is simply one plus alpha over TB. And if you're wondering what is this alpha, well, this alpha shows up right here. And depending upon the alpha, this will smooth out
or it can actually become even sharper um, with it always having the same inflection point and it'll result in slightly different um, tails going on to here and typically alpha is chosen to be between 0.3 and 0.5 and it has to do with um, the ability to achieve the filter because as you can imagine the sharper you get this the harder it's going to be to actually implement so our total bandwidth of the uh, filter is 1 plus alpha over TB I'll just let you know right now this is an equation you need to know if I give you alpha you need to know TB. It's not so hard though because basically the bandwidth is roughly 30 to 40 percent um, larger than 1 over the period of our symbol rate. So I'd like to show you uh, the effects of pulse filtering and to start with let's take a look at a random sequence of rectangular pulses. So I'm just going to hit play here and you can see I'm just generating a random sequence of ones and zeros. And uh, the rectangular beakers are pretty much just a sharp edge. This is sort of the digital data that we think of. And the question now that we want to answer is what does this look like when we uh, filter this? Because um, as we know that the spectrum of these sharp edges is going to create a very wide spectrum and we don't want to transmit that. We want to somehow uh, limit that. So let's actually go and take a look at the spectrum of the rectangular pulse. So I show it here in brown and you can see the spectrum is actually quite wide. So it's continuing out here uh, and would continue on uh, forever if we had infinitely sharp uh, edges. And so we want to attach some filters in order to uh, limit the bandwidth. And I'm going to look at three different types of filters. One is a low pass filter and that's shown here sort of in the pink. And you can see it's a standard flat and then it tapers off uh, here uh, so that it filters out just the lower frequencies. And this may be just a, a simple multipole low pass filter. We then have uh, what we studied in lecture, uh, a root cosine filter. And that is this red um, filter here. And you notice that it has a very tight bandwidth. And the reason it does is because the cosine has an impulse response. Um, that looks like a sync function. We know a sync function in the time domain would give us a perfect rectangle in the frequency domain. So the root cosine impulse response was basically generated to give us the sharpest uh, pulse, uh, sharpest filter we could get in the uh, frequency domain. And then I also have here something called an RRC. This is a root raised cosine. And this is sometimes used by um, in systems where you create your root cosine by cascading two root raised cosines. So this is just the square root in the frequency domain of the root cosine so that when you cascade them you end up basically creating uh, a root cosine. And the reason why you cascade is you might put one root raised cosine on the transmitter and one on the receiver end. So our goal is to try to use these three different filters to limit the bandwidth of what we're going to transmit. So let's go take a look at what the pulses look like from each one of these different types of filters. And I'm just going to rerun this simulation so you can see it. Uh, the pulse waveform is in the back and the three different filtered waveforms are here. The blue is the low pass, uh, pink is the raised cosine, and red is the root raised cosine. Uh, just for uh, exactness, I'll mention here that I have delayed each one of these streams so that they uh, overlap on the center of the digital stream so you can compare them. The delay of each filter is different so if you just um, hook this input into the three filters uh, you get different delays of pulse sequences. So I've aligned them uh, so that we can compare them together. So let's just take a look and so here's our random stream and you can see we get random pulses from each one of these and it's pretty clear from the root cosine and the uh, sorry the raised cosine and the root raised cosine that we get these sort of sync function pulses here's a great example on the left both of these look like a nice uh, sync pulse um, and you see that the low pass filter it's not too bad we get a little bit of a pulse but you can see that it's slightly delayed and it also changes depending on what came before. They all change on what comes before, but the low pass seems to be a little bit less ideal, a little bit less like a series of sync pulses. However, to be honest with you, um, I really couldn't say that the pink or the red or the blue, that one's better than the other. I can sort of see that pink and red look a little bit better based upon our target sync function, but um, 
you know the blue seems to have peaks in the same areas so what we want to do is figure out a way where we can better compare these two and and the way to do that is basically to think about a receiver how would we receive these pulses and what would they look like and so if you imagine that you're a receiver what you're going to do is see these waveforms coming in and you're going to be sampling and what you'd like to do is sample at the right point so that when it's high you get a high value or a one and when it's low you get a low value or a zero.